Hello, my name is Paul Lunn, and I work at the College of Veterinary Medicine at NC State. My objective today is to explain the meaning of herd immunity and how it could be important in limiting the spread of COVID-19 in people. This picture of a herd, or actually a flock of sheep, can show you a lot of how they all feel, but it really tells you very little about their risk of catching an infection. So, let's unpack herd immunity and what it means. First, the word herd, which is often used to describe a large group of hooved animals living together. In this case, we're talking about populations of people here at NC State. So, as we are talking about the wolf pack, let's talk about pack immunity. Next, what is immunity? Longer explanation. This word describes all the mechanisms our bodies use to protect us from attack by infectious pathogens, which include viruses, bacteria, parasites, and fungi. Now, there are two types of immunity, and we need them both. The first is called innate immunity, and it is there all the time. It includes everything, from the physical barriers like your skin, to chemicals and cells in your blood and tissues. The innate immune system naturally recognizes and attacks invading infections. It is fast and always ready. Without it, life is impossible, or at least very, very short. The innate immune response also has limits, and more sophisticated infections like COVID can get around it. This is where the second kind of immunity comes in, the adaptive immune response. After we catch an infection, like a virus, a special white blood cell called a lymphocyte produces immune responses that target that virus. These responses include antibodies, which are big proteins that stick to parts of the virus, effectively neutralizing them. Other responses are the very cool killer T lymphocytes that destroy virus-infected cells in our bodies. The first time you get infected, the adaptive immune response takes days to develop, so we can get sick and even die. But once it develops, it can control the infection and leave us immune or protected from repeat infections for months and sometimes for life. There are two ways to become immune. One is to get infected and survive, and the other is to get vaccinated, where we intentionally expose ourselves to a safe version of a pathogen in order to make an immune response. Humans have been using vaccination for a very long time. The Chinese people used this method for centuries to protect themselves against smallpox virus infection. Finally, an English physician called Edward Jenner not only created a new smallpox vaccine, but he published the method in 1796, naming the technique of vaccination and starting an ongoing debate in society between those who welcome it and those who fear it. Nearly 200 years later, in 1977, smallpox virus was wiped out of existence by vaccination. There are those who say this is humanity's single greatest achievement, banishing a disease that probably killed 300 million people in the 20th century alone. Okay, big breath. Well done for making it here. That was two centuries of immunology in less than five minutes, normally a three credit course at least. Now let's get to grips with pack immunity. Let's do it by talking about influenza virus infection, because we understand that pretty well. Imagine a hundred people living together on an island. None of them have ever had flu before, and one day a couple arrives on a boat who are infected and shedding influenza virus. Right away, an influenza virus outbreak starts on the island, as everyone is susceptible, and every time an infected person coughs, they fire out a cloud of virus-laden droplets. Sound familiar? This is what you see happen in the upper panel of this image. Now, this is a small island and a very social group who meet and mingle a lot. Soon, everyone has caught flu and hopefully survived, and developed a protective immune response and eliminated the virus. At this point, the flu virus has nowhere to go. It can only survive in infected people, not in the environment. 
However, everyone got pretty sick, so next year, before a new strain of influenza gets onto the island, nearly three quarters of the people get vaccinated. Which does mean that one quarter do not. Once again, a new couple arrives with a new strain of influenza, but it fails to spread beyond a few people. The people who had been vaccinated are protected. But it turns out that the majority of the unvaccinated people don't get it either. Why? The answer is pack immunity, and you can see it in the lower panel of the image. There just weren't enough unvaccinated people available to support virus transmission on the island. The flu virus tried and failed to infect people who were already immune because of the vaccine, and it just died out. This pack immunity depends on a lot of things. How long infectious virus is present, how easy it is to spread, and how much contact there is in the population. All of this can be described by something called the Basic Reproduction Number, or R0, which can be used to work out what proportion of the population need to be immune in order to achieve pack immunity. For influenza, with a reproduction number varying from 1.4 to 4, that vaccine coverage must be from 30 to 75 percent. For a much more infectious disease like measles, with a reproduction number around 15, you have to vaccinate a remarkable 95 percent of people to prevent spread. That is why controlling measles is impossible without essentially vaccinating everyone. Now, the basic reproduction number is the number of new infections you get from a single infected person in a population that has no immunity. We can also measure the effective reproduction number, or RT, which is the number of new infections you get in a population when some of the people are already immune. This is a number you can change either by vaccination or by wearing masks, social distancing or disinfection. Once you get this number to below one, you get pack immunity and no more spread. So, for the virus that causes COVID-19, which is called SARS-CoV-2, the R0 in many populations may be around three. This would predict that in order to prevent spread of COVID-19, we may need to vaccinate 60 to 70 percent of the population, or the same number need to become immune because of exposure. As you can see from this diagram, which was made around the beginning of May, we are a long way from pack immunity in many countries, and this has not changed a lot since. Given the seriousness of the disease and the real risk of death, we do not want to achieve pack immunity by letting this virus infect most people in our community. All this makes vaccination an attractive option, although first we need a vaccine, and then we need people to agree to use it. Last message. Even after we achieve herd or pack immunity, that won't necessarily end all new infections it will probably just reduce the numbers drastically. With a virus like SARS-CoV-2, it may continue to circulate at a much lower level, something called overshoot. This means this wicked problem may be with us for some time to come.